So uh, let me just switch over. Uh, so that's me. I should probably stand underneath my arrow. Uh, I, got a, I actually got a new, new job now. So I, I, I used to be director of digital cultures and creativity. And then we changed the name and all sorts of stuff. But I have this odd life. So I have this life as an academic, but I also have this life as an artist. I think but as with many academic artists. So um, I'm going to try to throw a lot of work at you. So hopefully we'll try to get something. But you can, uh, if, if whatever uh, we can't get through, you can also just go on elahi.umd.edu and you can see a lot of the other work. But you know, one of the things is, in particular, when I'm talking in front of uh, schools and well, students, because you know, it really wasn't that long ago that I was in one of these seats, uh, hearing like these artist lectures and kind of going through all these things. And so, you know, I think it's important to talk a little bit about work that you probably, well, that I would normally not show, <laughs> so things that are not on the web, or also just things about, you know, how, how works evolve. I mean, it's easy to see the results of something, but it's much more different, it's very different when you're actually going through and looking at how, how work evolves over, you know, 10, 20 years or 30 years or whatever. So one of the things I'm thinking about is, uh, I'm sure many of you that are the, in, the, in the students right now, uh, you know, you kind of go, because I remember it wasn't that long ago that, you know, how, how do I fill up, how do I fill up one of those like slide sheets of like 20 slides and you're kind of like holding them up and kind of like looking through all of those and uh, all of a sudden, how do you, you know, then you go, go to this situation where you're going, how do I fit 20 years of work in 40 minutes? <laughs> so we're going to go through some of these things. Uh, so I want to start off like super, super, super early. This is really about as early as I can go. Hey, by the way, I should actually start before I get moving on. I should try to say uh, that I kind of stumbled on being an artist, never really intended on it, never really just, it just kind of happened, and it happened in a bizarre way. So I actually, I never finished, uh, I, never, I never finished high school, and so, but I started college, and I had like 200 credits and nothing to make a degree in, and I kept switching schools and switching majors and switching, from, I'm sure some of you are in that same, same situation, you know, you remember, you know, it's like you've, you've switched schools and ma you've switched majors so many times, you're gonna go, you're going, well, what, what am I doing? Kind of thing, and I was in that exact same situation not that long ago, and uh, I needed to, and, and I, don't, I don't mean this any flippant way, but it was really like I needed to get a degree, because I, I didn't even get a GED or anything, so I had like nothing, I had like no formal degree of any kind, and uh, my uncle, who's an administrator at a small school in Pennsylvania, came to the house in Brooklyn and said, look, this is getting really embarrassing. You need to get a degree in something. So he handed me a school catalog. This was back in the days where you know, it was like a book and you had to like, flip through stuff. And I'm going through it. It's like, it's like wow, look at this. I, I, can get a, I can get an art degree with only 27 credits. And that, yeah, as crazy as that sounds, that was my rationale. But, but the other side of it, the other side of it is it was really the in the arts that allowed me to use that as a platform that let me study anything to any extent. So had I, you know, if I was interested in physics, I'd actually have to learn a thing or two about it in order to create a project on it. And if I was interested in 17th century poetry, I'd actually have to go and figure out a thing or two about it. And so sorry about the feedback, I'll try to stay back over here. It's probably kicking in from there. So, this is, so it, it gets to this thing where by using the art as a platform, I could really pursue any academic discipline I wanted to to any extent and still make it work. And, and it kind of worked out very nicely in this way. So now, you know, I'm in, in my other academic life where I'm dealing with 30 different departments and I'm going from this place to that place. So one day I'm talking to like astronomers and the next day I'm talking to the behavioral science uh, and then the next day I'm in the engineering and then in the humanities back and forth. So it really helps having a broad understanding of it. Let me show you this really early thing. So I actually have a training in printmaking. Uh, and, and I absolutely can't stand ink. And I hate the texture of newsprint, which is probably a bad characteristic for someone to make. And I would be making these prints that didn't have any ink on them. Uh, so it was kind of like, well, what is this? I mean, they're not exactly the traditional printmaking sense. But, but what, what really interested me was not necessarily the technique of printmaking, not necessarily in the wiping down of the plates or the, or the lithostones, but what I was really interested in, what a print did and how it functioned. How you started off with a singular point A and you had multiple point Bs, this way of distributing information. And we really think about it, in, in, at, least in, at least in Western history, you know, when you think back to 1450 and, look, and think about Gutenberg and the movable type and moving these little blocks of wood around and putting ink on it and pressing it, and all of a sudden you have two of them. I mean, if you think about prior to that, I mean, you know, how many, I mean, 
a monk would often toil away an entire lifetime replicating that one book, which was the Bible, and who had access to it? You know, the king and a handful of nobles. I mean, really, no one really had access to it. So it was really this replication of this book that allowed this distribution of information, which then created this distribution of knowledge and literacy and generated a middle class in a lot of ways. So I think this has been really, really amazing to watch uh, this whole thing come together. And when you follow that lineage, it's actually not that different than when you're looking at, say, uh, say when, when you follow that and look through etchings and looking through lithographs and looking through screen prints, it's not that different in radio, film, television, and the internet. So you're dealing with information being spread. And that's what I was really interested in. So this is a very, very, very early work. And I was really interested in this, this thing of like working with light as this material. And I wasn't really sure whether it was a 2D or a 3D or a 4D. Uh, I mean, this, I was very, I was so, I, I, and again, a lot of things that happen in school is you don't necessarily have the vocabulary to create that, I mean, at least I didn't. And, and it, often you sit on works for years and years and then they finally start making sense. Sometimes you work out of compulsion, sometimes you just work out of you know, various uh, models. But, and, and the other thing is, the crazy thing in school is you can never output at the same level you're getting input. And that's just absolutely impossible, the amount of information that's coming in on a daily basis for you to output at that same level. So sometimes it actually just sits there for a while. And I was really interested in, in this, this, now thinking back on this work, you know, this was certainly not what I was thinking when I was creating this work, but thinking about now looking at this idea of physicality and virtuality, how some things are physical and some, some things are virtual, and, and working with light kind of gave me that. Uh, I want to uh, move a little uh, quickly for some of the other ones. So I went to schools outside of Detroit and Eight Mile Road, for those that missed the Eminem movie, I mean, it's, it's literally a wall at the northern end of Detroit, and north of Eight Mile is all the, the rich suburbs, and south of Eight Mile is Detroit. And what I was really interested in is this, this line, this demarcation. So I got in my car and just drove up and down this line and photographed every intersection going north, every south, and I kept repeating this over and over and over, just driving this Eight Mile Road back and forth, which, by the way, is the first road that to completely cut across an entire state in one straight line. And it's really in the Midwest that these lines, these perfectly gr uh, grids start, and really this, this way of, of demarcating the territory and creating these lines and these squares. You don't see that in the East. Uh, well, first, the topography, that, because the Appalachian Mountains, but also the cities are older. You don't see that, that grid system that you see when you fly over Indiana or, or Michigan or, or many of the parts of the country, or particularly in this uh, Mich uh, Eight Mile Road, which is also Michigan Route 102 that comes all the way across. Anyway, so uh, I was creating this, this installation in the studio and uh, I had these contraptions and these lights on tracks and these cables and based on what was happening, the lights would move. And the reason I wanted them to move because I would coated the back of these prints with these reflective liquid and the way the, the light would hit it, it would dance and it would start moving around and start doing all of these things. And I really liked the visual effect of that but you know, here I'm like sitting there like ripping my hair out trying to time it and trying to figure out how to do this. And then I realized, well, wait a minute, why am I building this? When, why am I building this track with these lights that move when if, I need, if, if what I need is a light to move, why don't I just project moving light onto it? And that's how I stumbled on working in video and using video. So a lot of video artists, I mean, I get called all sorts of things, sculptor, video artist, performance artist. Sometimes I get called con artist. I mean, you name it. Uh, but I'm really, uh, what I'm really interested in is, in this case is how, how the material of video, or in this case, film, really, because this was pre-video, and how the movement of it is really what gives it content. Because when you freeze this, when you, when you freeze the video, as, or the film, in the, in, as you can see up there, you really don't get much information. And it's only in the motion, when you look at the 20 frames that come before that, or the 20, 30, 40 frames, and then you look at the 20, 30, 40 frames that come after that, that's when that one frame makes sense. Now, when I was creating this, that wasn't necessarily what was happening in my head, but, it only, it, but now when I'm, looking, when I'm doing my more recent work, and I'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that in a little bit, when you take one image out of a data set of like 20,000 images, that one set doesn't, that one image doesn't really have that much information. The information is really in the continuous, in the, in the larger database. And that's where this image comes in. Uh, 
other really early work, uh, you know, it, it, things in Detroit. So I went and got these monitors and ripped them apart, which this is a project I would never do now because of the, the voltage and all of these things, but I, was, I decided to rip these apart. And they're, they, they're suspending maybe about three feet off the wall. So when the projection hits it, the shadow of where that lo the monitor hits, that's actually where, the locate, where, the, where each of those factories that are depicted on the monitors are. So there's all these, like, you know, these gigantic derelict factories all over Detroit, these automotive factories. And what I would do is I'd take my uh, video camera and just walk around the perimeter over and over and over. Not necessarily as a documentary, but not necessarily as a performance, but really just these, just these walks around in the circle, or, well, really rectangle around these, these, uh, these factories over and over and over. And those videos were shown on top of the monitor. But when you look at it, some of the monitors were so high up in the air, there was really no way to actually see them all simultaneously. So I went and got these rear view mirrors from each of those factories. So like down here, that's the Buick old Cadillac plant. Up there is the Mack Avenue plant. Uh, some, somewhere up there is the old Studebaker. So from each of these uh, factories, from the assembly lines, I put the rear view mirrors from those. And from one central location, you actually can see the entire city in the rear view mirrors that were being angled up from the monitors. And if you think about it, that's actually not that different than some of the surveillance work we think of. But surveillance was not necessarily something I was thinking about, or even in my vocabulary at that time. But these concepts, now, now that I look back at these works, they start making sense in looking at these really, really early works and how they fit in with these more, more recent works. Uh, uh, I'm, gonna skip, I'm, let's, I'm gonna go to this one. Um, actually, I think, uh, some, uh, Kamran, I think you may have been at, the, at, the, uh, at Kakaku when I was using this video as a test on some of the loops. And uh, so there's, there's, a, there's a term, wet feet, dry feet, which is, uh, it's, it's a term for uh, official US immigration policy. And it only applies to Cubans. And it sounds like something that Came, it sounds like some, someone came up with it at a bar. So the way this works is if you're a Cuban refugee and you're, you're apprehended while your feet are wet, you get sent back. If your feet are dry, you can stay. If you're Haitian, it doesn't matter. You get sent back whether your feet are wet or dry. If you're Dominican, you get sent back no matter what. But if you're Cuban, your feet are dry, you can stay. Sounds crazy, doesn't it? But this is the rule. Dry, meaning on dry, uh, with dry feet meaning on dry ground, wet feet meaning if you're apprehended in the water. So this was at Surfside, which is the town just north of Miami Beach. And uh, I moved to Florida in 99, and this happened just right before I got there. And there was an incident where a group of Cuban refugees were about to make landfall. And the Coast Guard hosed, hosed them down with water cannons and pushed them back into the sea where they were apprehended, and because they were, their feet were wet when they were apprehended, they got sent back. So you can imagine life can't be that great for, in Cuba for trying to escape. But here we are talking about these real broad, and these real abstract ideas of democracy and, and, and liberty and freedom. And yet, as crazy as those rules are that we have, we still will play by them only when they benefit us, meaning you know, like, I mean, how could we actually do this when we, when we talk about all of these things, about all these atrocities and things that are wrong, but yet we will push back these groups. And even though we know that if they actually come on the ground, then they can stay. That will, that's the rules. But uh, so I went back to this place and I was like, you know, how to, uh, I try to find where, where it happened and, if, and I located the place. And I put my video camera on the sand there and just let the waves just come in and out. Just try to record that space. And thinking about the, in this way of, you know, can, can, can geography remember trauma? Can, can the location remember what happened there? If you think about it, you know, why is it important that we put up these monuments on, on, on this site, General so-and-so defeated so-and-so, and that's why it's important? Why, why do we memorialize that one location and not that spot over there? So, you know, can, can the location that we're memorializing remember what's happened there and can, does it have a sense of memory? I was really interested in that idea. I mean, I'm not sure if, if it actually did anything, uh, but the recording of this, it was just the act of trying to record this and the video kept looping over and over and over. 
around this column. And, and this, is, this has been reinstalled a couple of times since I've shot this. But this was really the first work that I did uh, looking at questioning ideas of citizenship. Because you know the prior works were a lot more, uh, uh, more cold and detached in this way. But actually, even this is kind of cold and detached, but really looking at the, the political analysis of it, or, or trying to come up with a creative response to a, poli to a political condition of the individual in the state. Uh, then this kind of happened, and I'm, I'm not going to go too, too uh, into this right now because next week's talk I'm going to be really going into this and where we're going to be discussing primarily this project. But uh, in uh, 2002 I got reported as, uh, I, well I got taken by the FBI uh, and I got apprehended at the Detroit airport uh, because there was a report that an Arab man had fled on September 12th who was hoarding explosives. And uh, that Arab man would be me even though I'm not Arab, and even though it wasn't the 12th, and even though there were no explosives. But you know, if you see something, say something, even if you just kind of like make it up. Well, that's what somebody actually did, and then I had to spend, you know, like the next, so basically, uh, I spent six months of my life with the FBI. But check this out, so, uh, so I get taken in over here, I get asked all sorts of crazy questions, like where were you on this date, where were you on that date? So they asked me, one of the questions was, where were you on September 12th? And you know, if you get asked a random date, where were you uh, April 14th? I mean, we can't like immediately remember, but I was like, I can't remember, but I can look it up for you. So I pull out my old Palm M505, and I was like, okay, let's see, September 12th, 10 to 10.30, paid my storage bill. 10.30 to 12, I met with Judith, who was one of my grad students at the time. 12 to 3, I had an intro class. Uh, 3 to 6, I taught my advanced class. You can see that I had to a party at Ryan and Mandy's house at 7.30 p.m. on Saturday the 15th in South Tampa. Uh, I mean, basically, we read about six months of my calendar. Uh, and anyone that talks to me for more than a couple of minutes realizes I'm not exactly a terrorist threat. But uh, I don't think this guy was actually expecting me to have such detailed records of everything, but fortunately I did, and if I didn't, it'd be pretty ugly. Anyway, so he believed me enough to let me go home, uh, which was Tampa, Florida at the time. So I went home, uh, back over there, and then I kept going back and forth into this building. This is the uh, FBI uh, uh, building, in, or the federal building in Tampa. And all sorts of weird questions, you know. Uh, it's like, do you belong to any groups that wish to harm the United States? Have you witnessed or participated in any act that may be detrimental to the United States or a foreign nation? Let me think about like those types of questions you're getting asked. Anyway, finally ended six months and nine consecutive polygraphs later. I was like, uh, you know, it's like, and, and at the end of the polygraph, the guy that's doing the polygraph, he leaves, and my regular FBI agent comes back in. And he says, uh, everything's fine. I was like, yeah, I know everything's fine. That's what I've been trying to tell you guys all along. You want to, you know, it's like, you know, can I get a letter saying everything's fine? Uh, you, get, you try to get, a, get a, uh, the, the way the legal system works, try to get someone to say you're not guilty of something you never did. So how does this work? Because this is all, out, this is all extrajudicial. There's no like legal things. There's no procedure. Uh, there's no like formal charges here. So, of course, and I'm, tr I'm trying to ask the guys, guys, uh, I travel a lot. All we need is the last guy not to get the next memo at the airport, and here we go all over again. So at that moment, he said, you know, uh, if you get into trouble, here's some phone numbers, give us a call, we'll take care of it. So I would always call my FBI agent before I go anywhere, because, you know, they need to know. And I said, you know, it's like, this is where I'm going. Not, you know, not like, you know, hey, it's not like I'm, it's, it's like, guys, I'm not up to anything shady. This is, I'm just, I'm just going to this place just to go vacation for a few days. I'll be back. Uh, or I'm going for work somewhere. Uh, anyway, so I created this. This was back in 2002 where, you know, the word app wasn't even used the way we use it today. I mean, now it's like everything runs off my cell phone. So basically what I did is I hacked my old cell phone and turned it into an ankle bracelet that kind of uh, follows me around. Uh, let, me, let me pull this up over here. So you get an idea. I mean, you can probably recognize that, that campus map or something that kind of looks like a building over there. You probably, I don't know, if you've, if you've been in this room, you can probably recognize this, this spot right here, which would be that right there, by the way. And uh, we can come out a little bit. And, you know, you can see that I'm on an island. In, and uh, we can come out a little bit further. And so, you know, there, there I am right there. So at this point, I mean, you know, we're, we're used to seeing ourselves as a pixel. I mean, it, it, it wasn't... But it wasn't that long ago. I mean, not you know, it was just a few years ago. It was really weird looking at yourself as a pixel. Think about it. Like you know, there was a time when you'd actually open a map and you'd kind of. And I, mean, I know some of you still remember doing this. You know, you open the map and you're going, "We're here." You'd have to locate yourself to the to the map to the geography. 
You'd have to place yourself in it. Now you pull out that magic phone and you press that button and you become the center of your map. The map resizes to you and, you, and you're that blue dot. So it's, I think this is a huge shift in looking at where, you know, where we used to place ourselves in a location and now the location adjusts to us. But uh, yeah, this is important because the FBI needs to know that on Thursday, uh, November 15th of 2007, I used that toilet. Uh, I share everything with them. You know, uh, they need to know. I'm all about full disclosure. I've kind of decided this. It's like, look, guys, you want to watch me? I'm totally cool with that. But I can watch myself way better than you guys ever could, and I could get such a level of detail that you'll never have access to. So I started basically just every few, every few moments, I would timestamp my life and send these photos to the FBI, you know? Because, I mean, hmm? Did you invoice the FBI? I should. Well, actually, they're kind of a collaborator, so, you know. I don't know if they, I don't know if they kind of acknowledge me as a... Uh, contractor? As a contractor, or, or maybe collaborator. You know, I, I, I like to think they're very creative. They, they, they make art with me. Maybe we should, we should credit the FBI for, for the exhibition, and maybe we can have some of them stay at Shangri-La, too. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a nice... By the way, if you folks haven't been there, go. It's like, it's an amazing pad. It's a, it's a really incredible house. Anyway, so you know, there's all these like little things like, you know, February 18th, Wednesday, that happens to be the Safeway in Fremont. February 9th, 13th, Friday, this is, uh, uh, no, that's an auditorium in Reno, Nevada. Uh, this is in Salt Lake City. I mean, you know, of course, I know all of these things because I can tell you who I was. Oh, by the way, my banking record's public. Uh, so you can actually see where my money is going and all sorts of stuff. My phone records are public. You don't know who I'm calling, but you know that from this location that I made a call on this date at this time. So there's all these logs. And I've decided to open my life up and tell you every little detail. Well, not just you, but also the FBI. But by telling you while I'm telling the FBI, well, it kind of, you know, it kind of defeats the purpose of the FBI having an FBI file on me. Because if you think about it, uh, I, have a, I have this FBI file. And I have this information, and, you know, and, and the, the, the information that's in that FBI file has value because, well, no one else has access to it. The FBI operates in an industry where it's the restricted access to the information that makes the information valuable, right? If we cut out the middleman, if we just give everybody all the information, the information that the FBI has has no value whatsoever. So thus it devalues their entire currency. And, and you know, I'm, I'm convinced if 300 million people start doing this, we're gonna have to come up with an entire new way of looking at data collection and data, uh, da data analysis. So really, it sounds kind of counterproductive, but by opening up every aspect of my life, I've become incredibly private. Because after a certain point, you don't really care to see that many more toilets that I've used. I mean, at, at a certain point, you go numb to it. Think about it, think about it. You know that friend that you got on Facebook that's only got five photos on? You've looked at all five of those photos. <laughs> that friend that got 500, you give up after a while. After a while, you're like, I don't need to see anymore. It's exactly that same concept. If you, if you put enough stuff out there, people will turn away from it. And, and so if it's all out there, well, no one really cares. So I've decided that to take that really even further, and really just put up so much noise that you really, you really don't know much about it. And I'm, I'm kind of living in this kind of a data camouflage. I'm kind of like, you know, this, the, 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 noise, the signal to noise ratio is so off that what you're really getting is this sheer amount of information, but you need to do all the analysis of putting together this with that, with that, with that, with that. So you really go into this perpetual mode of trying to replay the role of the FBI agent, trying to piece together all of these bits and pieces of data. So uh, let, me, let me go back to over here, and, and I want to show you this piece. So I've collected, like, I think close to 70,000 images right now of every, every you know, just every, every time I go to a different place, there's a new photo that gets uploaded, and the database is just getting larger and larger and larger every day. You know, I've been working on this, what, more than a quarter of my life. And uh, so this piece, what at first looks like this rather modernist grid, I mean, when you look at it, there's all these bits and pieces going on here. But uh, you know, the idea of camouflage is really important here. And if, you, and if you think about camouflage, historically, camouflage was used so the, the silhouette, the, the body of the soldier would blend in with the landscape. So this is why you had like trees. And, and you know, trees look different everywhere, so we had different type of battalion or different battalion gear for everything. But have you noticed 
the trees, have you noticed, not the trees, have you noticed the camouflage that we're using today? Pixels. You ever seen trees that, like that anywhere? You ever seen the, do you notice the color of the, of the camo that we're using now? The greenish, grayish, kind of beige-ish, but not really beige. You've seen, have you noticed anything in nature that looks like that? Huh? Google Maps, Google Maps maybe, yeah. But you know, what's interesting is, so what's happened is, you know, in the past, when you look at, like, say, the Vietnam era camouflage, which is the, the iconic camouflage, and, and, you know, in, in art context, I mean, you know, you've seen it in, in the Warhol prints and so on. But when you look at that, there was a very specific need for that. That was the Woodlands uh, camo that was designed in 74. And where we needed the soldier to blend in to the jungle of Vietnam. Today's camouflage, the ACU that we use, it's no longer needed for trees or the landscape, but we need the, we need the soldier to blend into the noise of the night vision goggles. So therefore, the enemy cannot distinguish between the soldier and the digital noise. So in a way, we no longer have a need to blend into the landscape, but to the machinery and to embed the tools themselves. And I think there's a huge digital shift that's taking place. Not unlike how in the past we used to look at ourselves in the map and locate ourselves, and now our map locates to us. But now, in a way, we have the situation where we are in warfare, we're embedding the machinery. And no longer, it's, it's no longer about the landscape of it, because the landscape really could be anywhere. And particularly these days with drone warfare, they, it really could be, you could be anywhere. The geography is no longer important in that. Anyway, so what I did is I took the sample from one of those camo and uh, pieced together these images and, and replaced each pixel with the point of historic or, or current conflict in many cases. So this plate of ham, which just looks like this plate of ham, well, that plate of ham was photographed in Guernica. Or this image, is this, these two images right here, right on top of the plate of ham, that was shot in North Korea on, on the 38th parallel inside the Korean DMZ. This image over here, this is an interesting one. And uh, this is kind of a geography question. It's, uh, there's a flag there, it's, and I realize it's small, but it's a red stripe, a green stripe, and then a red stripe. Anybody know this flag? Red, green, red. Just three stripes. No? It's a trick question, because the country doesn't actually exist. It's a breakaway republic of Moldova called Transnistria, or the Russians call it Prednistrovia. And it's about 15 miles wide, but about 200 miles long. Uh, it's not recognized by any country at all. No one recognizes them. But uh, if you need to go buy 20 cases of AK-47s, that's the place to go. So this tiny little sliver has caused so much destabilization in the world. And actually, you're hearing a lot about this because a lot of the arms that are taking place in, in you, because this is very strategically right on the other side of Ukraine, between Moldova and Ukraine. And uh, it's, it's getting pretty sketchy over there. But anyway, so we saw all these places. And again, looking at different ideas, different, different locations of conflict and replacing each of the pixels out. Uh, let me sh show you a little bit about how some of these other work. So I've, I've collected thousands of these images over the years. And so this was one of those, uh, uh, the way this was installed at uh, Sundance. So when you walk into the room, there are all these monitors all around. And you're just bombarded. Well, actually, well, originally we were going to do these with monitors. but we realized that there wasn't enough, enough electricity in the space to power 139 different monitors. So we had to use the input channels and convert them to projections. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, so when you, when you walk into the space, you're completely surrounded by these images. Kind of like not unlike the, the, the design of the Panopticon, the, where, the, where the guard would be in the middle and all the prison cells would be around the, uh, around the perimeter, where the, where the prisoners couldn't tell when the guard was watching and when they were not watching. So, by the way, there's a person right there, so you can get an idea of human scale of the size of this place. And so what you're really watching is you're being continuously bombarded with these images, and there's really no way to actually process these images. And we see these kind of security mm -hmm. consoles with all these monitors, but really a lot of that stuff, it's not really meant for human reading. It's really meant for machine reading. So our machines are actually looking at the images and analyzing what that image should look like and what is normal and what is not normal. And I'll get to that in a little bit. Uh, during this whole time, I was also doing these other works that, in similarly dealing with tracking and such, but in a very different way. And I also do a lot of these collaborations with other people, whether they be 
with scientists or artists or who knows what else. So here's an interesting piece because of all the people that can relate to being fall, uh, uh, in, in, incorrectly being uh, accused of terrorism, it's the Basques. Anything that goes wrong in Spain, it's the Basques. It doesn't matter whether the Basques are involved or not. You know, they just get blamed for everything. So in 2005, I got uh, selected by the Basque government to do this project with this Basque oceanographic research company. And I'm like, what do I do? I, I don't know anything about this. So they, they, they uh, brought over 10 different artists and designers and architects and they put us in a, uh, they basically dropped us off in these research centers and said, okay, come up with something. And uh, so it's like, you know, what do we do? I mean, we're kind of like looking at each other going, well, okay, you guys, you guys are an oceanographic research company and I'm an artist and I don't even know how to swim, so what do I know about this stuff? So anyway, so we're sitting in, you know, it's Spain, so we're, we have this gorgeous, uh, uh, beach front or uh, waterfront cafe in the middle of lunch with a couple of wine bottles on the table and I'm like hey Alberto uh, if I take this bottle and if I chuck it in there can you tell me where it's going to go and he's like absolutely and you think about it this idea this message in the bottle this there's so many romantic ideas or you think, really when you think about it, it's like you know it's one of the most lo-fi forms of communication of long-distance communication I mean, you, you know you think you're throwing the bottle out and you have no idea where it's going. But these guys are like, we know exactly where that's going to go. And it's like, that's how we calculate shipwrecks. If we get the signal from here, we know to look over there because the waves and the, and the currents and, the, and everything else that goes on in the sea, that changes. So I said, okay, this is interesting. So we took these bottles of water and we filled them up with half, well, there were full bottles of, of spring water uh, from a Basque spring nearby. And we emptied the bottle exactly halfway, capped it up with this cork uh, with, that's used for, uh, uh, for, uh, for production, Chacoli. Chacoli is a very unique wine that only comes from this region of the Basque country. And we took it to the edge of the earth. I mean, literally to the edge of the earth. And we set them off. And we set them off in a way where they would float back to, earth, float back to shore exactly where we left off. Actually, the edge of the earth is kind of like only like five kilometers out there, but it's that, it's that point where you're standing on the edge of the sea where the earth curves over and you can't see that point anymore. So we went to that point, dropped these bottles off and tracked them. And then when they came back, when they came back to shore, we took them inside the museum and uh, filled them up with these little fish tanks that were uh, filled half with salt water. Uh, and, and the salt water was the water from right outside the, the right on the other side of the street. We modified the salinity levels to match 31 other seas in the, in the, in the world. So, you know, even though the Candabrico uh, Sea, which is right in front, is like 32.5 is the salinity level. So we would actually modify that to, so this would be like the Red Sea, which is a much higher salt, uh, salinity content as opposed to the Black Sea, which is a very low salinity content. But based on the salinity content, and this was great having the scientists there, because they'd be like, hey guys, what's the Gulf of Finland? And someone would be like, 14.7. They just like knew this stuff off the top of their head. But based on the salinity was with the angle that the, blow, uh, that the bottle would float in. So the scientists are looking at this and, this, and they, they're able to tell which is which just by looking at the angle of the bottle. So it's this like super, super lo-fi way of taking the super high-tech mm -hmm. data and we think, we, when we think of data visualization, we tend to think of like really fancy, lots of computers and lots of computer monitors and screens and data mining and things. But this was such a low, such a lo-fi way of looking at data visualization and looking at scientific salinity levels of throughout the uh, throughout the world. Anyway, um, I want to show you a little bit. I've been I've been hanging out a lot in airports lately, and this is something that I mean. And I think I guess if you live in Hawaii, you, you know, I mean, you're going anywhere. You're, I mean, you're kind of, I mean, most people aren't sailing these days across oceans, so you're probably, you know, you're probably doing a lot of airports. So I, I created this, uh, this airport, this mega airport that spans from sea to sea. And actually, that's, that's Honolulu Airport right at the bottom over there. And uh, so I connected all of them. So basically, you can go from one runway to the other, to the other, to the other, all the way across. Kind of this fictional mega airport of like every possible type of things. And, um, you know, because, you know, we, it's kind of to match the TSA, to match the, their kind of the, the, the security theater and the mega security airport in that same sense. And then this, uh, it, this was carved into this huge slab of marble 
or actually huge pieces of marble that were pieced together. So you saw, so, and actually this took place at the Park Avenue Armory, which is this, you know, normally when you think of that, that, that huge building that's got this all broad open space, but there's this, but there's rooms upstairs and there are these gorgeous rooms with these beautiful wood floors with all the luminaries of New York history painted on the walls. And uh, so this was a real appropriate place. And right on top of it was a homeless shelter. So a real interesting juxtaposition of space and location and purpose and use of that space. Anyway, one of the reasons I want to show you this is I want to show you this piece, which is every airport that I transited through in 2005 and 2006, or every photograph that I've taken at every airport. And you're just seeing a huge barrage of, well, it kind of just looks like pixels and noise. And the reason this is important is because this led to this, which was just done, uh, this is 800 video channels running simultaneously. There's 800 videos playing like at, uh, and, at any given moment. And I mean, of course, you can't really see any of them. I mean, you can see them, but there's no way to actually focus in on one tiny little sliver because everything's moving around at every place. And they're all in these tiny little pieces. The reason this is important is because I'm working on a project for the uh, San Jose Airport, which I'm still, it's been going on about five years now. And, you know, when you go to the airport, it says, you know, welcome to whatever airport. The airlines actually have to pay for time on the airport, on, on the gate. And often the airlines will only buy X number of hours before and after the flight because, you know, there's no reason for them to pay for 24 hours at that gate, especially if they don't own the, uh, the gate. So, so San Jose uh, worked out a deal where whenever the airlines weren't paying for the uh, time on the monitors that it would switch to art and that's some of the videos that I was working on is what would be shown on those monitors. So the problem is, and you have to remember, like for, for years I've been trying to get the FBI to give me a document saying I'm okay. But in order for me to get paid for this project for the airport, I have to be employed by the airport. And in order to be employed by the airport, I have to go through a Homeland Security Threat Assessment. So this gets really messy here, and it's like, what, you know, what, 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 so in this, so anyway, so they set my file up, the, the people that do all the clearances at the airport, and they said, look, you're going to be difficult, but okay, so we're expecting this, so they send it, and I get a call back from the person that handles all the clearances, and she's like, hey, uh, your paperwork came back, it looks exactly like everyone else's, there's nothing any different about it, but the FBI called me this morning, and they want to meet with me about you. So even though it's completely clear, something's being flagged somewhere where that's being, so there's a shadow database that's taking place. Anyway, so in February 21st of 2009, I was given this badge. This badge lets me walk around the airport with a Sawzall. I can actually climb into the ceiling with this, or at that time I could have. I mean, this is kind of crazy how we go from one end of it to completely, you know, where I'm being like, investigated by the FBI for terrorism-related activities, and then a few years later, they'll actually let me go into parts of the airport where I can actually go literally into the belly of the airport. I mean, this gets pretty, pretty freakish. So just this piece of itself, just to get, gather this, uh, just even the card itself kind of becomes this work, this long project. Uh, let me show you some other things. So I've been doing a lot of data mining projects. And uh, I ran across this document called Instances of Use of United States Armed Forces Abroad, 1776 to, to uh, actually, it's, yeah, 1776 to 2006, and then it was appended to 2009 later. It's a congressional report that chronicles every time U.S. troops have been used on foreign soil without that other country's permission. Essentially, every time we've invaded a country. We've only declared war, I think, 12 or 13 times in history. but. We've had about 330 incursions of where we've landed troops, where we've placed troops on another country's soil without that country's permission. So we've actually invaded other countries over 330 times since independence. And sometimes they're as simple as, you know, uh, back in 1827, Marines chased pirates onto this Caribbean island. Well, the Marines landed on that island. That wasn't part of the US. That's one incursion all the way to World War II. That just counts as one. So everything just counts, so everything's just, just the facts. Everything's been like calculated to one. So when you look at this, all the white X's are all the ones from 1776 to World War I. Now you feel like, you know, when do we invade Florida? Well, that, that was when it was Spanish territory. When do you invade California? Well, that was before it became part of the United States. All the gray X's are from World War I to Vietnam, and all the uh, dark X's are from Vietnam to today. 
The number of invasions from 1776 to World War I roughly equate the number from World War I to Vietnam. Uh, no, 1776 to World War I roughly equate the number from uh, Vietnam to uh, World War I to Vietnam, and the numbers of invasions from 1776 to Vietnam roughly equate the numbers from Vietnam to today. So we're on a pretty steep trajectory here. So if you and if you see where our activity has been a lot, you know, the lot in uh, in the Middle East, uh, Bosnia, a lot in Central America, and a lot in West Africa and Timor over there, uh, very specifically. So I decided that uh, we're going to do this project in Spain with these curators and these folks. And I put this idea, it's like, okay, let's take that map and we're going to put this huge slab of bulletproof glass and we'll just mark a little map and we'll have a, we'll have a shooter at one side and they'll fire and the bullet will stop in front of the, in front of the audience at the, at the museum. And I knew that this, was, this wasn't going to happen. I, I, I kind of knew that they were like saying, <laughs> You're crazy. There's no way we're doing this. But to my surprise, they said, uh, let us look into this. We'll, we need to contact our legal folks, and we'll get back to you. <laughs> so in the meantime, we did some ballistic tests of what it, and actually, the way, bulletproof, the way bullets hit bulletproof glass is beautiful, because you can see the way they start. So what happens is the bullet comes at such heat that it melts the plastic, and the plastic fuses back around it. And uh, this was, I mean, so we, we did a whole bunch of these tests of different kinds of rounds, different kinds of plastics. And then they called me and they said, you're crazy, there's no way we're doing this. But we did this uh, in the end. So we took this out to, uh, so, and, oh, and th this, this was a, for a show in Spain. So we thought maybe we could do this in the US and ship it to Spain. But then the problem gets to be, well, we don't know if Europe will import this as art or, or firearms because there actually is real gunpowder in it. So you run into some customs problems. So it's like, you know, let's not take any chances of running into some mess, uh, messy things with, with customs. We'll just build this in Spain. Then we run across this pesky Spanish law that requires a minimum distance of 25 meters to discharge any weapon. So you're roughly 80 feet, 90 feet away. And you have to hit a target that's like this little. That's a quarter inch. And I don't know if any of you shoot, but that's not exactly, especially trying to get 330 of them consistently on that accurately. It was like, I don't know, how, how are we going to do this? So the museum hired some former Olympians. And uh, they, of the 330, 326 of them are exactly on center. And the four that they're off, they're off by maybe a quarter of an inch. And I'm convinced I just drew them wrong. These guys are scary, and, 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 and it, you can see it. Like, look, look at Central America. Like, we've hit, we've invaded Central America so many times that the bulletproof glass just fell apart and it just gave way. Because if you keep shooting, eventually it'll, it'll, the glass will fall apart. So it's a real, like, visceral look. At, I mean, it's a, it's a literal wreck of of what we've done in some of these places. And when you see it, like, when you touch the back of the glass, I mean, you see the you see the bulging out of the plastic, and and I mean, it's it's a real direct. Uh, linked, and it's, just, it's a very direct reaction of seeing what happens when this kind of firearms hits over and over and over and over and over. Anyway, uh, I want to quickly run through a couple of more projects. So I've been working with this physicist in Boston uh, about, well, he's interested in behavior and, and, and predictive behavior. And he heard about my project and he said, hey, uh, we've been studying people, so we, w we would love to look at your data. So I said, sure. So I sent him the spreadsheet. He sent me back this, which I have no idea what this is. This is not a geographic map. This is a probability map. And I don't know if you're a physicist, but uh, if you see, there's like these 8.0 e minus 4, 4.0 e minus. I have no idea what that means. But what he, what, basically what it is is that he's got data on millions of people. And if he has your data, which is essentially your phone records, kind of like all of your generating with your cell phones, and uh, if he has this data, he can predict your whereabouts between 80 and 93% accuracy, with, within 80 to 93% accuracy. So he'll say that on October 29th, you're going to be at this spot at this time. And the prediction rate will be that close to being accurate. So I sent him my data, and he's like, uh, you're completely throwing off our system. I mean, you're, yours is like 0.04%. So which means that I'm completely unpredictable, or at least that's what this guy's, his, his premise. I mean, he, and he's convinced that when the FBI saw my pattern, they saw someone that so didn't fit anything that there was something going on. I think he's given them a little too much credit, but 
My wife just says that I'm, 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 it's not that I'm unpredictable, I just change my mind all the time. <laughs> but we don't, we're not really sure exactly what it is. But this actually is a really good uh, uh, scientific example of, of this. Let me uh, forward. So, so Laszlo sent me back that, and then that created this installation. So this is a dome that was created about three feet high and about 12 feet in diameter. And this video just projected all the way through. And if you notice, there's all these, like, what seems like this random pattern. But these are uh, all the photos of the US taken in the Pacific Northwest, Southern California, Texas, Florida, Northeast, Upper Midwest. Kind of like a 21st century of Namjin Pike's uh, electronic superhighway. But kind of like looking at it, this, uh, of, of these, all these pieces being uh, pieced together. Let me show you a couple of other pieces. So remember that pixel pattern that we saw earlier with the, that was a very early piece in 2006. So I started looking at how that pixel pattern was generated and the Army has a fashion design department at Natick. They don't call it a fashion design department, but they're the ones that actually designed the camouflage. And uh, they, there's public record about how they go about it, which is kind of interesting. You'd, you'd, you'd imagine that that wouldn't be public, but it is. So I started running, you know, when you record audio, you get the voice, you get the waveforms. You've seen that? So I decided to pixel, pixelize those, and uh, this is Dick Cheney's voice saying the word democracy, and then pixel, I mean, not that you can reverse engineer and play that, but it was important that that be Dick Cheney's voice, and it'd be him saying that one specific word. But, uh, so all of these photos, so they're all the photos that I've shot and sent to the FBI that, that are played across these small monitors. Uh, and what you're really seeing here is this other, uh, this, it's kind of the works moving into a different direction where, um, it's kind of like as if you had x-ray vision, you could see through the walls. So this, let me show you this one, this is a little easier. So this, right on the other side of this wall was the Baltimore Police Department. And this is, uh, so, I, I, so you didn't, when you were looking at the piece, you didn't know whether you were looking at a video or a still or a photograph or what was happening. But if you think about it, what do you, what do you think of when you see surveillance camera imagery? And you see kind of, you know, th picture surveillance camera imagery. You, you often tend to think of like pixelized, kind of gritty, grainy, often black and white images. But if you think, of, think about the pictures you've taken with your cell phone, think about the quality that you've taken. And why in the world does surveillance camera imagery look the way it does? There's no reason for it. But the problem is that when we hyper aestheticize surveillance imagery, our brain rejects it as surveillance. We no longer read it as surveillance and we read it as landscape or in the case of landscape photograph here, or which is, you know, the, the, the history of landscape photography is really not that different than the history of landscape painting, where, you know, you think of these, uh, the exploratory paintings of the West, of surveying and measuring. Uh, when you think of the, the a lot of the photography, a lot of Ansel Adams' photographs, we think of these gorgeous, beautiful photos, but they're very much in, in you, they were created in the use and in the measuring and in the surveying of the West, of the expansion. So, and a lot of those are based off of uh, a lot of uh, American paintings and the landscape paintings of uh, the Hudson River School, where you have these gorgeous grand vistas, these almost spiritual, these eye of God type paintings. And we tend to think of surveillance as being this very 21st century concept, but if you think about it, and if you follow the logic of American painting history or landscape history, and, and connect all that back through, it really is looking as God as the original surveillance camera. And you've had, you know, we've had thousands of years of being used to being watched from above. I and mean, we tend to think of that camera kind of up there as kind of this relatively, but we're, we, we have this idea and we've been, we've been and, and we regulate our behavior based on whether we're being watched or not. We regulate our morality based on whether we're being watched. Uh, so this is, so this idea of like, looking at this as hyper-aestheticized surveillance imageries. And, and often, so this x-ray vision, so you can see right through the walls, and this is what you would see in this piece. And then they've taken on different forms sometimes, and this is uh, how it looked like at a, at, a, at a show in New York uh, earlier in this year. And this is the most recent one. This was just installed just a few weeks ago in Scottsdale, Arizona. But let me show you a couple of other things, and then I'm gonna quickly try to wrap up over here. So this is kind of in, in context of what it looks like with these orbs. This is uh, all the, again, uh, similarly to that Dick Cheney voice piece. You're looking at these up here. A little bit more of an intro. This is, uh, so you know, so you, we're all generating piles and piles and piles of data all the time. This is an important uh, building. Uh, I don't know if anybody recognizes, but this is the AT&T Data Center in San Francisco. So in, in, uh, in 2007, we had the, the NSA wi uh, wiretap scandal leak, where uh, the NSA approached 
uh, 16 telecom companies and said, uh, we'd like to copy your data stream. And 15 of the 16 said, sure, help yourself, be our guest. There's only one company that objected and said, you know what, we're not really sure the legalities of this, come back with a warrant, we'll, we'll give you what you're asking for. Interestingly enough, that company no longer exists. But the other 15 were like, sure, and, and right on the sixth floor of this building is where the NSA set up shop uh, of, uh, to copy AT&T's data stream. This building, which AT&T's code name is Hawkeye, contains, at that time, in 2007, contained 320, terabyte, 320 terabytes of phone conversations, basically every phone conversation on AT&T's network after 9-11, and which is absolutely impossible to, to humanly listen to, but it's meant for machine reading. Now, this brings up a really interesting issue. So who does, this, who does that phone conversation belong to? So say you're talking to grandma. Does that conversation belong to you or grandma, or does that belong to AT&T? And they're licensing you the use of that conversation. So this, when the data is being stored, per, and think about it, how many of you actually delete spam? I mean, you just kind of like leave it there, I don't know, I mean, I leave it there and just Gmail, I don't know what, what it does to it, it just goes somewhere. So this perpetual storage, I mean, archiving has become so cheap, there's no reason to delete anything. We just keep piling on, keep piling on, keep on, and this is where all this data is. So we kind of have to think about what happens to these databases as we're keeping them in the longer period. Uh, anyway, so I've been generating all this information and it just keeps building up more and more data. And uh, I'm kind of watching who's watching me, watch me. Uh, so these are all the folks that have come by, and, or some of them, this is a sample of my log files. And you can see like dhs.gov, uh, state.gov, Department of Justice, uh, I mean, and I made a nice little pretty list of all the friendly folks that come by. And most of them tend to be in the DC area. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, like uh, the National Reconnaissance Office. I'm not really sure what they do. Actually, they have a, they have a station at Cana Point over here. Uh, but also, uh, you know, like the CIA, they come by a terror screening center. So I decided that uh, the only logic that I can come up with is that they, uh, there's a lot of fans of art in these organizations. <laughs> And, and, uh, and I have to thank Dick Cheney for making my art career possible. Because if it wasn't for Dick Cheney, none of this would actually be possible. So I, I owe a big one to Dick Cheney. So a few, uh, about five years ago, I had this really amazing opportunity to, uh, for this position at the University of Maryland. And when I say University of Maryland, when I say Maryland, a lot of folks think I'm all, uh, in Baltimore. And, and although I live in Baltimore, the university is actually inside the Beltway in DC. So you can see that's like 495, and there's College Park over there. That's where it is. By the way, if you were to triangulate the location of the FBI headquarters, the CIA headquarters, and the NSA headquarters, it pretty much lands up smack in the middle of our campus. So this couldn't be more appropriate, and I had to go. I mean, I mean, you know, it's, it's like, you know, we've got this budget issue, this federal budget problem, so why don't I just move, like, right between all of them just to help them out? The problem is, you know, I love living there, but, you know, real estate now isn't exactly cheap. Uh, I mean, you can see, like, I'm looking for a place, and you can see this Media, the average listing price for zip code 21663 is $797,303. Uh, $797,303. Of course, somebody in Hawaii, that's like, yeah, that's probably a budget uh, accommodation. But for the rest of the country, that's actually like pretty steep. Anyway, so I found the spot, which happens to be right here. It's on the eastern shore of Maryland. It's about an hour and a half away from campus. Uh, and a uh, little close up over there. And they've got a really nice, it got fancy neighbors nearby. See that house over there? Belongs to this guy. So, uh, you know, and, oh, and his buddy lives up over here. So when you leave St. Michael's, the first road is like Church Neck, and Church Neck splits to, I'm sorry, no, it's Railroad Street, and Railroad Street splits to Mount Pleasant and Mount Misery. And the reason it's called Mount Misery is because at the end of that street, there's the old Covey plantation. And uh, Covey was known as a brutal slave breaker. And if you had a particularly problematic slave, you sent him to Covey. And Covey, in most cases, would beat him into shape, and in some cases, beat him to death. Thus the name Mount Misery. One particularly problematic slave that was sent to this house was a young boy by the name of Frederick Douglass. The Frederick Douglass began his rebellion in this house right over here. Remember, this guy lives here. This house belongs to this guy, Donald Rumsfeld. Uh, it's kind of, kind of sick when you think about it. Anyway, let's go back to this house that I'm going to build on this, pa this patch of land. At least I'm trying to, I'm, I'm hoping to build this. And uh, let's, let me show you around the neighborhood. So this is the front yard. Uh, this is the driveway. 
Uh, he's got a five car garage. Two of them go back pretty deep back there. This is a swimming pool. This is, uh, by the way, when you hear that undisclosed location, 7879 Fuller Drive, St. Michael's, Maryland, 21663. That's the undisclosed location, or one of the many undisclosed locations. Uh, Darth Vader likes wisteria. Uh, this is his front room. This is his kitchen. This is where he sleeps. This is the place that I'm hoping to plot world domination with him in, in, on the attic. And I'm hoping to build this in front of his neighborhood, in front of his house. Uh, I'm not sure, you know, it's these covenants in these neighborhoods, these fancy neighborhoods are a little difficult to, to do that. But, but if you think about it, you know, if I can get this information totally legally and totally public, here's quite possibly one of the most secretive men in recent history. And if I can show you where he sleeps, what can he know about us? So, you know, I'd like to leave it as that, you know, we try to think of privacy as a very different thing. And I think a lot of, a lot of the ways when we think of privacy from the past, we really need to rethink it, what it means for the future. And again, if, if I can get this information, what can he get about us? What can companies that specialize in this? What can entire countries that have quite possibly unlimited resources what can they know about us? So I'd like to leave it at that, and uh, thank you very much. And I would really urge us to rethink what it means to be private today. Thank you.